Hey, my name is Amanda. I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you find your next step toward Jesus. Enjoy the message. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Good evening. Merry Christmas. Ah, it is so good to see all of you here. I'm so grateful for this custom of ours, this tradition now at LaCroix, the Christmas Eve offering and what we do. Thank you for your generosity. Have you ever noticed that Christmas is perhaps the most tradition-laden holiday of of them all? Uh, And traditions vary from uh, one family to the other, uh, but they become part of our our family stories, part of our family history. Uh, For instance, the custom of putting lights up in the house. Going to get a little audience participation there. How many of you decorate your house with lights on the outside? How many do that? Yeah? So the rest of you don't, right? Yeah, I won't have you raise your hand to admit that. Um, And then trees. Okay, let's do this. How many of you are artificial tree family? That's what you guys do? Yeah? Yeah, okay. How many of you live? The rest of you? Yeah, live? Okay. Living trees? Do you, does your insurance company know that you do that? Huh? <laughs> How many of you will open your gifts tonight, Christmas Eve? That's your custom. Do Christmas Eve. Yeah? How many of you will open them on Christmas morning when God intended them to be opened? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Good. Good. Come to church and have the pastor just trash your traditions, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, when it comes about, about those gifts, um, there are different traditions there, too. Are you the kind of family where uh, you make the request? You know, you make a list. You're not going to get everything on the list, but you kind of make a list. Or when I was younger, I went through the catalog. If you're really young, you may have to have that, someone explain that to you and, and, and mark up the things. Or there's the surprise. Like, no, Santa brings it. It's, it's just a surprise. How many of you are the make a, a list kind of crowd Yeah, people? Yeah? How many are surprised? Or how many, a combination of both, right? All right, yeah, that's where most of us are at, okay? Well, you know, the, 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 the original Christmas that we celebrate here tonight, it's kind of a combination of that, um, that ask, that request, that wish, that prayer, and, and, and the surprise. Because for, for generations, for centuries, God's people were asking for a deliverer. The surprise was it wasn't exactly what they thought it would be. It didn't come the way that they thought it would. Um, but God's people have, have learned down through the centuries to ask. So as I begin my message tonight, I just want to ask you a very simple question. What do you need from God today? Maybe you haven't thought about that. Or some of you, it's at the forefront of your mind. What do you need from God today. Jesus would say, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. What do you need from God today? Um, People have prayed and asked things of God for a long time. In fact, our, um, our Bible is filled with prayers. The book of Psalms is a prayer book. It's also a song book because they would use that to uh, sing from as well. And the Psalms are just filled with prayers and asking and requests, especially around God sending a deliverer. In fact, let me just, let me just read a few selective Psalms. I could go on and on, but here's just a couple. Psalm 109, help me, O Lord, my God. Save me in accordance with your love. 
Psalm 70, hasten, O God, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to my rescue. May all who rejoice and be glad in you, may those who love your salvation always say, Lord, let, let, let God be exalted. I'm poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O Lord. Or Psalm 38, O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Come quickly to help me, O Lord, my Savior. And then Psalm 39, hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Some of the Psalms, the, the writer was so down and in such a pit and in such a hard place that, that their Psalms were what we call Psalms of lament. They were cries. God, help me. Come to my rescue. And God sent um, these people called prophets. Prophets, their first job was to sit, to listen to God, to hear from him. And then they would go out and share the message that they heard God speak to them. And, and sometimes they had to deliver a hard word because God's people were straying from the path. They were worshiping other gods. And sometimes it was a word of judgment. But always mixed in that and always leading the way was the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. And that one day he will answer his people's cries for help definitively and completely with this one called the Messiah. And so there are a lot of words from the prophets in the Old Testament that speak about the coming of this Messiah. And some of these we, we uh, you'll typically hear quoted around the Christmas season, like the one from Micah, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Hmm. The Messiah will be from ancient times. Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And then these beautiful words from Isaiah. As he was answering the cries of God's people, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his, over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. As God's promises, he's strong in these promises. He's going to come through. He's going to deliver his people. And then here, here are the last words from what we call our Old Testament, from the prophet Malachi. It says, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And that's how the Old Testament comes to an end. And after that, there's no more prophet. There's no thus saith the Lord. There's no word from on high. There's nobody um, bringing new words of God's promises and hope. And the people are plunged into darkness. There's nothing except what was said before. What was said in the past for them to hold on to. These have sometimes been called the, four, the, the silent years. There's 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Scholars refer to it as the intertestamental period. As you can see why, it's between the two testaments. And it's a period of 400 years, and there's no word from God. And not only is there no word from God, it is a difficult time. It is a hard 400 years. Well, at least the last 300 were. They, the people of God would be subject to three different empires who would rule over them. First was the Persian Empire. They, they reigned from 532 to 332. You can see the extent that it was huge, including little Israel. Now, the, the Persians were in control the last 100 years of our Old Testament, and then the first 100 years of the 400 uh, intertestamental uh, years. And the Persians, as empires go, they were pretty easygoing. 
you know, pay your taxes, they were fine. They let you kind of do your thing. They had a live and let live philosophy. And then in 332 BC, Alexander the Great marches through. Arguably the greatest general in world history. While he was yet in his 20s, he conquered the known world. And Greece came to power. Now, the Greeks were not like the Persians. Where the Persians were live and let live, the Greeks forced their ways on all of the conquered lands they, they controlled. It was called Hellenization. You, they said, you will speak our language, you will follow our customs, you will, you will observe our holidays, you will worship our gods, and you will pay taxes to us. Well, the people of God in little Israel, and we can do a couple of those things. We'll learn your language, but we are not worshiping your gods. And it led to constant conflict and persecution and much bloodshed. And the people cried out, and there was nothing. Have you ever prayed? And it feels like your prayers aren't going any higher than the ceiling. That's what the people there felt. And it went from bad to worse. After Alexander the Great died, his kingdom, uh, the Greek kingdom, was divided into four parts, you may remember from world history. And, and uh, people fought. It was violent, one faction against another faction. And Israel got caught in the crosshairs. And there was one, um, one ruler in particular who was especially vicious. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He uh, was ruthless. He hated the Jews. And they hated him. And they insisted on worshiping their God and to just rub their nose in it. He went into the temple and took a pagan altar and sacrificed a pig. Jews don't eat pork. It's an unclean animal. He did this just, just, to, just to humiliate them. And this happened over and again until finally they could take no more. And they rose up in, in opposition. The, the Maccabees, under Judas Maccabees and others, they, they, the, these, these uh, brave warriors drove the Greeks out. And they'll have finally deliverance. And then the Roman general Pompey showed up in 63 BC. And you think it was bad under the Greeks? Ooh. Rome would give you some freedom, especially around worship, as long as you worship Caesar first. But they were ruthless. You pay our taxes, and their taxes were very, very high. You follow our laws, and if you don't, we'll kill you. That was the basic, the deal. And they killed a lot of people. And they loved to humiliate people by crucifying them on busy roadways. And they cried out, Lord, help us. And nothing. 400 silent years. Until one winter's night in Bethlehem, the voice of God was heard again. And it sounded something like this. The psalmist said, listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. God answered the cries and the weeping of his people with his own tears. And he came into this world as a helpless, defenseless baby. Nobody saw that coming. And he brought salvation. Paul would later go on to say, about this, he says, but when the time had fully come, or at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. Emmanuel, God with us. This was the, the one who spoke the world into existence, came to live among us. He shared our brokenness lived in our world, walked in our shoes, experienced our pain and our own suffering. God himself. God has answered those centuries 
of prayers. Those cries for help. God has answered in Emmanuel. This past uh, couple of weeks ago, we were blessed to have born our second grandchild this month, four, sixth grandchild, but two born this month. And uh, my, our daughter named her Eliana, which means God has answered. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> Do you like how I slipped that in? Wasn't that pretty smooth? I mean, you got to admit, it was pretty good, you know? It, it actually fit with the sermon. You know, a lot of times it just doesn't, but it kind of did. Oh, uh, yeah. Hang around. I got about 400 more pictures to show you. We'll be good. No. God has answered. But you see, it, here's the surprise. Well, that he was born, but um, the Messiah went on, and he did things you would expect God to do. And he said things you would expect God to say. But he died on a cross, murdered by the Romans. But he rose again. No one was expecting that. They expected a resurrection, but at the end of the age. Not in the middle. They expected a, a Messiah, a king, at the end of the age, but not in the middle. And so Jesus, when he's with his disciples one last time on the Mount of Ascension, says, I, I, I will be with you always. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So now... Here we, like the previous children of God before the Messiah, we're in, the same, in, a, in a similar place, except now the Messiah has come. And the kingdom has come in Jesus, but it's not fully here yet. The world is dominated by sin and selfishness and pain and suffering and war and hardship, difficulties, all of that. Um, and so we stand here on this side and how do we, what do we do? Well, we do what the ancient children of God did. We pray. We pray. Advent is this season that has a double meaning, you know. Advent isn't just about remembering the birth of Jesus. Advent literally means coming. We remember the first coming of Jesus. But Advent, for the first thousand years of the church, was really focused on the second coming, that he's coming back. And so we learn to pray. I read the last words of the Old Testament for you. Here are the last words of the New Testament. The book of Revelation, it says, he who testifies to these things says, I, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. A blessing and a prayer. Our Bible ends with a prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. That means, in Greek, it's Maranatha. Sometimes it just simply gets stated that way. Come, Lord Jesus. How did God answer the first thousands of years of prayers with himself? Emmanuel, God with us. And now he says to pray. Um, so, how do we do that? Luke 11 says this, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. It's interesting. This is the only time we know the disciples ever went to Jesus and asked them asked him to teach them something. He, they never said, Lord, teach us how to preach or teach. Lord, teach us how to heal the sick or cast out demons. He's, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because stuff happened when Jesus prayed. And, and also, it just seemed like he was in a different place. What it did. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead, a, lead us not into temptation. Now, you may recognize that as the Lord's Prayer, but y'all also may recognize some words are missing. That's because Luke's version is shorter. Maybe because it's not so much about getting the words right as it is praying to the one who hears our cries, the one who answers our cries. And so to illustrate this, Jesus tells a story I won't go into great, great detail, but listen to the story. It says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I, don't have, I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, well, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. 
So he tells this parable about, about prayer. Now, there's two schools of thought about interpreting this. One is that he's saying, you know, just be audacious and ask. And if you keep on asking and, and pester God, he's finally going to give in. He's finally going to just give up and give you what, you, what you've asked for. That's not, that's one interpretation. I kind of side with the other school, which really takes into consideration the culture of that day. Let me explain very quickly. Ancient Israel, like the Middle East today, was a, uh, a culture that honored hospitality above everything else. You showed hospitality to people. If someone showed up at your house, you gave them food and lots of it. All right? Um, when we mentioned Mozambique earlier, that's where we dig those wells through the Mozambique Initiative. I've been there a couple times, and they're a hospitality culture, and they're very poor. One of the things Americans have to take into consideration when they travel to places like that, don't bring a lot of people. Because if you bring a lot of people, they will bankrupt themselves to make sure that you get fed. Even though here we're wealthy Americans, they have little. They will, they will empty out all the savings they have to, to, to feed you. Because in a hospitality culture, the worst thing you could ever do is not show that hospitality to a visitor. So that's what's going on here in this parable. And it says, because of a shamelessness, well, which... Who's he is he referring to? The guy knocking on the door? I only think it's the one, it's, it's really the one inside. You see, it was also a shame and honor culture, and hospitality was really important. He's thinking, if I don't get up and give this guy bread, I, I can't walk, I can't show my, my face tomorrow on the market. I can't show up in the village. I'll be walking through like this because I will have shamed my name and shamed my family by not giving him something to feed his visiting friend. And so he gets up and does it. And Jesus goes on, how much more will your Father in heaven? You see, he will, he will answer your cries because his name is on the line. His reputation is on the line. And he will do good by us because he's good. So Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. And those who seek find and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. He's really telling us, don't be timid. Ask. Do you have a need? Ask. I, I, I got to admit, this was hard for me because I grew up in a family. My mom was pretty proud. She was a single mom. And uh, we didn't have a car. We lived in St. Louis. So you can get around on the bi-state bus and, and a cab. And she said, you're... If you're someplace, don't ever ask someone for a ride. Now, if they offer you, fine, but don't you ever ask. You get, you get a bus, you get a cab. And so it, it, it was a little harder for me to, it, it took me a while to be able to learn to ask for things. And maybe some of you are a little timid when it comes to this. And he's saying, don't be timid, ask, seek, knock on the door. God is gonna, he's gonna answer. Believe that he'll answer, not because you got the words right, but because he's so good. It's just who he is. So keep on asking. Keep on receiving. That's in the present tense there. He says, ask and keep on asking. But he also, you'll receive and keep on receiving. One person I read uh, put it this way. Something always happens when we pray. That's why Jesus says to keep on doing it. Mother Teresa once said, when we pray, we are expanding our capacity to receive. See, when you pray, you are expanding your capacity to receive from God. So I ask you, what do you need from God? He says, your kingdom come. That's a prayer. That's a good prayer. Paul tells us later what that kingdom is. He says, in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Anybody need more of that? What's righteousness? Righteousness is doing the right thing at the right time with the right spirit, the right attitude. I don't know about you, but sometimes I may do the right thing, but I don't, don't do it with the right attitude. That's called sin. <laughs> So I need righteousness, peace. Uh, research after research study in America shows that levels of anxiety are up and to the right and higher and going through the roof. Do you need peace? How about joy? Has your joy been stolen from you? God wants to give that to you. And then notice what he says. Then he goes on, he says, um, why? Because God is good. Which, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? No dad's going to do that. That's nonsense. He says, if you, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Would you see that little thing God did, Jesus did there? How much more will he give the Holy Spirit? He didn't say, how much more will he give to Holy Spirit those who ask for the Holy Spirit? Now, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, God's going to give that to you. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. But he says there, whoever asks you is going to give you the Holy Spirit. One ancient theologian, one of the early church fathers, said that the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of the love between the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father. He is the embodiment of the delight that the Father takes in the Son and that the Son takes in the Father. You receive this third person of the Trinity. You receive God and more of him. God has come near. So for thousands of years, God, God's people prayed and asked, and what did God give them? Himself. In the person of that baby in the manger, in the person of Jesus. And now, on this side of the cross and empty tomb, we pray, and what does he give us? He gives us himself. He gives us God. So, I'll ask the question that I asked at the beginning. What do you need from God today? What do you need from God today? Ask. And it'll be given to you. Seek. And you will find. Knock. And the door will be open for everyone who asks, receives. Those who seek, find. And those who knock, the door will be open. What do you need? Ask. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. That when your people cried out for a deliverer, you sent your son. You didn't send another prophet to give another word. You came. You are Emmanuel. And yet you walked among us for only 33 years. But you said, I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you again. And you send the Holy Spirit. You send yourself. Father, I pray that everyone here will have their hearts open to the fact that what we need more than anything else is you. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill the hearts of those who are in need. Come and fill the hearts of those who don't have righteousness or peace or joy. Give them a boldness to ask and a trust and a faith that you are good you will answer. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to share this with others that God has put on your heart. To learn more about LaCroix Church or to find your next steps, head to lacroixchurch.org. Thanks again for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.